Um, so as Dan was saying, um, we're doing this project um, on Neolithic axes um, and where they're made. Um, we're doing it as uh, part of the uh, Canada Landscape Partnership Scheme. Um, this is a, a big um, project funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund, um, which involves um, a, a significant number of partners coming together, working under the leadership of the uh, Snowdonia National Park Authority. Um, and the aim of the project is to uh, help conserve uh, the Kanade um, uh, mountain landscape um, by engaging local people with the, um, the uh, cultural uh, and, uh, and um, uh, landscape heritage um, of this area. Um, and they're doing uh, various things like uh, gorse clearing and footpath work, but also uh, heritage projects, including uh, looking for sites on LIDAR um, and recording oral history, um, and including our project um, on the landscape of Neolithic axes. Um, and back in uh, 2019, we started this project doing sort of a, a test season, um, and we started doing some um, test pits uh, near Cranbervecken, and we had various volunteers um, digging test pits uh, in this field, um, looking for traces um, of uh, Neolithic axe making. And we were uh, planning to carry on doing that in 2020. Um, but of course, uh, the COVID pandemic happened. Um, and we tried to get going um, in October of 2020. Um, but then there was the Conway local lockdown and then the national lockdowns um, and really it wasn't going to happen that year. Um, but at last we've been able to get back to it and doing field work uh, in 2021. Um, so uh, it's good to be back actually doing work on the project. Uh, but just before um, I actually get into telling you about what we found, um, I'll go through a little bit of quick background um, for people that haven't um, heard me talk on this before. Uh, we're looking at uh, the Neolithic period, which is uh, in Britain from 4000 BC to about 2500 BC. And this is a really critical period uh, in our prehistory because this is when uh, farming was first introduced to Britain. So you get this sort of major change that eventually led to our sort of current uh, culture and, and landscapes. Um, there were also other big changes then that um, the dead were buried in uh, quite impressive tombs made of big, big stones, these megalithic tombs. Um, and also the new technology of pottery was introduced. So this was a radical new technology. You could make uh, entirely new kinds of vessels. Um, and one of the uh, real sort of signature uh, finds from this period is the stone axe. Uh, these are polished stone axes. Um, unlike earlier stone axes, they're, they're ground all over um, and often polished um, to quite a high finish. And some of these uh, are very beautiful. Um, when I say stone axes, I'm really meaning um, the axe head itself. Um, these axes had handles, had hafts. Um, and we use pretty much like we would use a, a, a metal axe. Um, and we know this because occasionally you get just the right conditions um, and the handles are actually preserved, especially um, in, in bogs in the bottom of the lakes, um, like uh, this example, which is currently in the British Museum. Uh, and these axes were um, critical for a lot of things that the, the Neolithic people were doing. Um, that they were opening up woodland to actually start farming, creating small fields, and axes uh, were important for that. And also um, for felling timber and shaping timber for making um, large buildings, um, because they started building uh, large timber structures uh, in the Neolithic. And down in southeast England, um, quite a lot of polished stone axes made of flint, um, but elsewhere in Britain, uh, people used very fine grained uh, igneous rocks um, and there aren't very many places where uh, exactly the right kind of rock could be found um, but some particular sources uh, were definitely more popular than others um, and one of the most prolific sources or the most prolific source 
um, is uh, in the Lake District, uh, in the area around Great Langdale, in particular on uh, this mountain called Piper Stickle. Uh, and in fact, this spree here um, is almost entirely made up um, of axe debris. Um, and although you could actually find um, rock of the right sort in much more accessible places, certainly at the height of the production, uh, rock was quarried right from a little ledge uh, on the cliff face. And you can see here somebody standing on this little narrow ledge. Um, and the rock face was actually quarried to produce stone uh, for the axes. Um, and this suggests that it's not just the quality of the rock that was important, but perhaps where it came from and these impressive places um, that this stone came from. Um, and that may explain why this was particularly popular. Um, and stone uh, from the, the Langdale source went all the way over Britain and even um, some axes may be, uh, be found in Ireland. Um, so this is very widely distributed, probably distributed by um, sort of gift exchange passing between groups uh, down the line, rather than anything we would recognize um, as trade. Um, after the Langdale source, the next most prolific and most widely spread um, source uh, is up on the coast of North Wales. And stone axes made from there went all the way over uh, southern Britain, um, England and Wales, um, and I think probably more into Scotland than this old map shows. These axes are referred to as Group 7 axes. This is the technical term for the kind of stone, um, but they're often called gry-gluid axes after the place um, that they're mainly thought to have come from. Um, and that's because back in uh, um, the 1920s, uh, it was found that um, stone axes were produced from the stone and the scree be below um, this little outcrop here, um, called a grey gluid above Penmine Mower. And you can see it partly quarried away by Penmine Mower uh, quarry here. Um, but there's still all um, the sprees down here covered in grass, which were definitely used for making the axes. And actually, there's some evidence of quarrying right up on the top here. And um, so this is why these axes are called grey gluid axes. But in fact, it's not just grey gluid um, stone that was used to make them. This hill here is actually a, a plug of uh, volcanic magma, which solidified before it reached the surface. Um, and the margins of this magma cooled quicker than inside. And they cooled so, because they cooled quickly, um, they cooled to very fine uh, grain. And this is the rock that's really good for making stone axes. And you can find it on grey gluid, but you can also find it all the way around the margin of this hill. And in fact, as we've been dis as we've discovered um, more recently, uh, that the screes below the mountain at this end were also used for making stone axes. Um, and above Clanvervecan, there are two more hills made uh, of exactly the same kind of igneous rock. Um, Garrig Vale here, which doesn't look that impressive from this angle, but there, there are some cliffs on the side. And below here, um, there's screes again covered um, in grass. Um, and those screes were used for making stone axes. Um, and I think one of my favourite hills ever, Dinas, um, which looks like it's a whole heap of screen. Um, and this one was definitely used um, for making stone axes. Um, and the, these areas above Clanverbecken, although they were vaguely known about by archaeologists before, there's been very, very little uh, attention on this area. Um, but local people knew that you could find um, evidence of axe working in this area. And um, particularly this gentleman, uh, David Jones, um, spent decades uh, looking for um, evidence of axe working and investigating this area. And a few years ago, he um, very kindly shared his information with me um, and showed me um, the sites that he found. Um, and I'm so glad that I managed to do it then because um, unfortunately, he died last summer, um, but at least we've got a chance now to take his uh, work forward. Um, and this actually forms the basis um, of what we're doing now in this project. So instead of just having one site um, that the uh, axes uh, were, were that the stone for the axes was acquired from, um, in fact, we've got a whole landscape of sites. 
um, that you have um, Dinas here uh, and Gary Bauer, and just up here um, on the edge of the uh, quarries is where there's another area of um, axe source. Um, and between those, um, on this map, you've got all these little uh, red dots, um, and that's um, uh, finds above Clanverbecken, uh, mainly of rough outs. Um, and when uh, the Neolithic people were making these axes, they took the stone and shaped it roughly. Um, and this is what we call a rough out. And this is what um, we often find um, scattered around. And it's really good evidence of axe working. Um, so you see these uh, all around. And you can see these are spread over a wide part of the landscape. Um, and this is just the area around Clangovecan. Um, so that's why our project is called the Landscape of Neolithic Axes, because we're not just looking at individual sites, we want to see how the Neolithic people were using um, this whole landscape. Um, but we have um, recently been focusing on the Clanverreckon area, um, because this is the area that's, that's re received the least um, archaeological attention. Um, and uh, last year, um, last September and October, uh, we looked at two sites in this area, one just to uh, the west of Dinas at the foot um, and one to the east of it. Um, something else you should sort of look at on this map is actually there's lots of other dots here um, because there's a lot uh, else going on, um, prehistoric um, and uh, earlier uh, historical activity in this area. Dinas itself um, has a hill fort on top of it. Um, and actually, Penrhyn Mao Mountain, um, there used to be a very large hill fort on there, Bright of Venus, um, until that was quarried away. Um, these purple lines are actually um, scheduled areas, and these are mostly enclosing uh, Iron Age um, uh, huts, uh, huts, hut settlements. Um, so these are round huts, um, and in fact, there's lots of others scattered around. And these are uh, within um, a whole field system. And actually, between these sites, you can see traces um, of what were certainly Iron Age fields to start with. But there are also uh, medieval um, huts within these, which are the uh, light blue circles. And um, so these fields are used through into the medieval period. So our sort of layer of Neolithic activity is covered over by all this other activity. Um, which obviously is going to influence uh, where we can actually find um, good Neolithic deposits. So in a way, we're also investigating some of this later activity as well. Um, and this is Dinas itself. Um, on this um, lovely aerial photograph, you can actually see the hill fort on the top. You can just about make out the inner rampart there, and there's other ramparts around the outside with a few hut circles in the middle. Um, there's also some hut circles which show quite well down here. But this shows um, these terraces uh, running down the hill slope here. Um, and these uh, are uh, remains of fields, almost certainly Iron Age fields. And in fact, in the background, you can see these really wiggly um, wall lines. I mean, these are walls of modern fields, but the wiggly lines suggest to me that um, these were uh, Iron Age in origin as well. Uh, and this view um, shows a wider view of the landscape. This is Dinas again, and here we can see looking down the valley towards Clamavecan. Um, here's Pemamau Mountain um, with the quarry just off to the side, uh, and the screes here um, are actually an important um, source of stone for axe making. Um, but this photograph shows also this sort of upland plateau um, known as Lime Clan Baya, um, which is just east. Um, of, of Dinas um, and this river sort of gorge coming down here, which is uh, Avon Mysa Brin. Um, and the site that we looked at in, in September um, is just here and um, just above the Avon Mysa Brin in this sort of rather higher um, upland area. Um, and this sort of also shows this area, um, so Dinas, and this is the site we're looking at. Um, and up here is Grey Gluid, so it sh shows this area is sort of surrounded by um, axe working um, sites. Um, and here's Wine Clan Via, which um, currently is uh, just a, a boggy morass. Um, uh, pollen work has been done here, um, and actually, even in the Neolithic period, um, this was quite a wet area. 
um, and there were certainly uh, older growing in the wet parts of this, uh, but the pollen work shows that there was um, hazel woodland up in this area um, with pine trees growing on the higher, drier land. Um, and down in the lower land, there would have been a mixed oak forest. So this would have been a very different kind of landscape, much more wooded um, and less exposed than it is now. Um, so that's definitely something to keep in mind when we're looking at these higher sites. Uh, this particular site, I'm calling uh, Mysa Brin. Um, and I, I just want to sort of be, be honest about this because I, I might be rather be confusing place name evidence. Um, I'm using the term Mysa Brin because it's the closest, closest place name to the site um, on the modern maps. But actually, Mysa Brin um, refers to um, a free, uh, a large enclosure south of the Avon Mysa Brin. And our site is just to the north um, in, in uh, a parcel of land that was actually known as Glanor Avon. Um, but because Mysa Brin appears on the modern maps and Glanor Avon doesn't, um, I'm using the, the name Mysa Brin um, for this site. Um, and we're not, we haven't chosen this site just at random. Um, back in um, the winter of uh, 1960 and 61, this field was actually ploughed um, for the first time in living memory, and it's certainly not been ploughed since. Uh, and Mr. J. Davis actually took this opportunity to field walk the ploughed area. Um, and he managed to find quite an extensive scatter um, of artifacts. He found many of these rough outs. This is what I was mentioning about uh, sort of the rough form, um, the sort of shaping stone to get rough uh, form of an axe. And then often they broke, or if, if they weren't going to work properly, um, they got thrown away, which is why you find them. Um, and lots of flakes from making these axes. Um, but he also found um, these objects here, um, which are actually finished, polished axes. Um, but they're ones that really um, have come to the end of their lives. This one has been rather roughly resharpened. Um, and these have been entirely sort of reshaped um, into new tools. So these are, are sort of almost X axes. Um, he also found a few uh, flint flakes. Um, and this is very important because flint flakes suggest other things were going on here, um, not just uh, axe making. Um, and uh, actually, um, uh, Mr. Davis thought that this was probably a Neolithic settlement site, um, and I certainly agree with him. Um, and uh, he, he actually said that he thought this whole area uh, would amply repay uh, systematic excavation. And finally, 60 years later, um, we've got a chance to try and um, do a bit of excavation up there um, and find out um, what's there. Now this site here, we've, this is where we're working right over here, um, that's um, over 300 metres away from the nearest screes. So this isn't just uh, getting stone to make axes. Um, and this is, this is why any stone we found there has been carried over here. Um, and this is why it looks like it probably is a settlement site. This is a site people are bringing stone to, to work it. And the, the flint flakes are suggesting they're doing other things here. Um, this, uh, this is a LIDAR image. Um, LIDAR uh, is a kind of um, uh, laser scanning from, from an aeroplane. Um, this is actually LIDAR from um, uh, NRW. Um, but the Canada Partnership have actually commissioned very detailed LIDAR survey uh, of the Canada. Um, and I'm just waiting for that to be processed and then we'll have uh, even more detailed uh, image of what the, the land is like around here. But on this you can see um, these uh, old field boundaries um, very nicely um, on this, including some much closer to where we're working. Uh, so it's, it's really quite high up, um, but because it was ploughed um, back in 1961, um, it's, it's actually not too rough uh, and quite um, easy to work. Here you can see uh, Dinas in the background, um, and we had a, a fairly small team of volunteers um, on this site because we had to have people that were fit enough to walk up there, um, and they're busy working there. Uh, and you can see this sea in the background, this is very close to this, this open plateau of wine and um, with uh, oil, Lewid and Talavan uh, beyond there. 
Um, and here's um, John Roberts, the uh, Snowdonia National Park archaeologist, um, who has uh, been jointly uh, running this project with me. Um, and so we had our team of volunteers. Um, you can see here this, this quite sort of lush grass there. It's impossible to actually find artifacts in this area, um, apart from in molehills, and we actually did find a few in molehills. So what we did was to dig uh, one metre square test pits, so we could actually dig through the turf and into the soil um, and actually find uh, what was in the soil and recover um, all the artefacts within those little squares. Um, we sieved the soil um, so that there's a good chance of actually finding everything, even uh, small artefacts. Um, and then, uh, well, I say we, the, the volunteers doing all this and then uh, actually record the test pits. Um, we relied quite heavily on our, our, um, our sturdy steed, this, this buggy um, on hire from the farmer, um, uh, Gareth Wynne Jones, and driven up there um, by uh, Karen Ryan Young, Carol Ryan Young, um, who is here uh, showing uh, to the volunteers how to record test pits. Um, so we recorded them by photography and by taking notes. Um, and where there were significant things for by drawing the sections or drawing plans. Uh, so this is proper archaeology, even if it's only in uh, a little uh, one metre square. Uh, so here's our layout um, of test pits across here. Um, on this LIDAR again, and on the LIDAR you can just about see that these, there's these straight banks here. Um, and I think these are actually from uh, boundaries of medieval fields. Um, but there's also a sort of curving scarp and other banks here, which I've actually uh, also surveyed on. Um, and I think those are probably earlier. So that's probably uh, the remains of an Iron Age field. Um, there are even um, a few clearance cairns with this area, um, which might possibly even be Bronze Age. Um, and over the top of this, you can just see very slight traces uh, of damaged ridge and furrow um, from medieval ploughing. And then there was the uh, 1961 ploughing over all this area, which I think actually probably came down to around here. So this whole area has had a whole history um, and prehistory uh, of agricultural use, which is bound to have affected uh, what we find. Uh, that red dot there, was actually the central grid reference um, for Davis's uh, uh, fine scatter. So that's what we used to locate ours. Um, and actually saying about um, the um, ploughing, in one of the test pits there's this stone and actually it's got these plough marks um, all over it. And you can see some of them are going in different directions. So this is actual proof that there's been um, a whole series of phases uh, of ploughing in this area. And um, here's our test pits uh, within the corner of this ancient field. So there's a, a scarp here forming one edge, a very, very slight bank um, along here. Um, and uh, at, so our test pits are sort of within the corner of this field. Um, but we put a few outside to see the difference between the inside and the outside of the field and how that's got impact on the survival of the, the Neolithic finds. Uh, we sort of found that Higher up, the soil was perhaps a little bit uh, shallower with a bit more of a buildup um, of soil against the bank and then a bit shallower again um, outside uh, the, the old field. Uh, so this is the kind of thing we're finding that you have the top soil and this latest ploughing here. And then underneath is this very mixed layer which that's clearly um, an old plough soil. So this is showing uh, ploughing within the field. Um, but here's one of the test pits um, just south uh, of, of the old field um, and actually that's got this really silty soil in the top and I don't think that was even ploughed um, in, in 1961 so that's probably never been ploughed and under it there's a, a layer of stone again which isn't disturbed um, and mixed so this is actually indicating that some parts of this field actually haven't been disturbed with ploughing um, and there were a few finds um, of, of axe debris uh, in these test pits outside the field. So there is a chance in that area of having these undisturbed deposits. Uh, so in these test pits, um, all these test pits had some uh, 
flakes for making axes. Um, but we had one here that had a, a lot of axe working debris. And then we put another couple more test bits in near it to try and have a look at this sort of focus um, of activity. And these also produced uh, lots of material. So we've got an area here where they were definitely um, working axes in this area. Um, but there was also um, a rough out from down here outside the old field, uh, another um, axe debris here. So it's possible that somewhere in this area there was also uh, a focus of activity. And then the number of flakes decreases as you go away from that area. But you can see there were fines from these uh, pits out here. And in fact, these are flint flakes. And um, so we actually got quite a few flint flakes scattered around. Um, and I wonder whether that suggests actually there were other things going on further over in this direction. And this might be uh, the area to look at for actual set settlement activity. Uh, so here um, are some of the finds. Um, I mentioned that there was a, a, a rough out. So this is the rough out that was found. Uh, I better say with um, with these images, the, the, you've got these pairs of images, and basically you're showing the front and the back um, of each of these objects. So this is the rough out. Here are the flint flakes. Um, they're very, very small. You can see here so, some of them aren't much longer um, than a, a centimetre long, but these are all uh, genuine work flint, flint. So these show that people are doing other jobs in this area. Um, and particularly this tiny um, object here. Um, and if we blow it up, you can see that this uh, flint flake has actually been worked neatly round the edge here to form a nice sort of curved edge. And this is what we call a scraper. So this is a very deliberately made tool. Um, and this is for scraping things, possibly for um, scraping hides to make leather, but possibly also for other jobs. But this is the kind of thing you would definitely find um, on a settlement site. Also, um, in one of these pits, in, in one of the pits that produced most of the axe working debris, um, we found this flake. Um, and I think you can just about see it, you can just see the, the light shining on this. Um, and that's because this surface here was polished. This is really quite smoothly polished. And that's because this is a flake from a finished polished axe, um, just like uh, the, the ones that. Um, Davis found. Um, so if you remember here, Davis found these polished axes that had been reworked and partially broken down. Um, and this is this shows that um, this kind of reworking was actually happening on the site because we have that flake from doing just that. Um, but we also found similar flakes when we were digging uh, at Parkbrink Kegging uh, near Plandigai. And some of these we found um, in little pits um, with uh, mid and late Neolithic pottery. And there was a suggestion there that maybe rather than actually reworking these old axes, they were actually deliberately breaking them down um, in a ritual way. So this is so certainly something we want to look at um, further and see if we can work out what's happening and exactly what these flakes from finished axes might mean. So that uh, is the uh, Mysa Brin site up at the top. Um, which really only uh, we only did um, 14 test pits, so this is really just a start, but that's that's pretty good results um, for uh, uh, four and a half days work up there. Um, the other site we looked at um, is down at the foot of Dinas. Um, you can see on this LIDAR image, um, this sort of rough area is where the screes are, and you can see the screes all the way around here. Um, but in this field, it's out of the screen, it's just on the edge of the screen, and we wanted to look to see how far axe working went. Certainly within this area, we knew there's plenty of axe working down here. Um, so this is the field that we looked at. Um, in uh, 2019, we dug 16 test pits over this um, field, and then in uh, October of 2021, uh, we dug 23 test pits, so this is all of them scattered around. Um, so we've actually got quite a good look um, at what's going on in this field. And again, um, we're doing test pits to actually be able to see through the grass um, and find the distribution of 
this axe working debris. Uh, and as well as um, the adult volunteers, I mean, this was a, a much more accessible site. So we had a, a much bigger team of volunteers um, on this site with quite a lot of people um, coming and going over, uh, over the, um, I think it was 10 days that we were there. Um, but we also had some uh, young volunteers helping us that we had uh, the Young Archaeologists Club uh, come for a day um, digging test pits. Um, and I think they had uh, quite a good time. And we also had um, uh, pupils from, um, from uh, the local school uh, in Clanbervacken as Gold Pan Pantoreddin. Um, and we had uh, 70 pupils in, in different uh, sessions um, come to the site. And this was arranged um, by, by Dana Moore um, with the help of uh, Rhys Muin and, uh, and John Roberts. And here we've got John Roberts showing the pupils uh, what they're going to be doing, digging the test pits. And uh, here's um, Rhys Muin. Um, identifying some of these flakes. This is a, a great project for children to be involved in because we were finding lots and lots of artifacts and they got very good um, at spotting the flakes and recognizing flakes from just ordinary stones. Um, and uh, this is uh, George Smith, who very kindly actually came to volunteer on site. He's um, actually the expert looking at all our finds, um, but he also put in some volunteer time digging them. And here he's showing uh, the pupils from the school, um, a, a rough out that he found actually within the section um, of his test pit. Um, so we've got all these um, test pits scattered around um, and this field is actually quite uh, steeply sloping. It slopes down um, towards the left hand side of the screen, um, but it doesn't slope evenly. There, there's um, various scarps in this field, so especially a big scarp in the middle. Um, and sort of terraces. Uh, so there's an upper terrace here and a middle terrace uh, and a lower terrace down there. Uh, and certainly this is partly to do with the natural undulation of the ground, but it looked as if um, these terraces were actually enhanced by ploughing and might have been what we call linships. If you plough along the slope, um, the, the soil will move down from uh, the upper side down towards the bottom part uh, of the field. Um, and actually the plough will eat into the upper side of the slope and will flatten off this area. And we were thinking this might be how the terraces were created. And this obviously has a big impact on how uh, well preserved the Neolithic deposits might be if there's been lots of ploughing in the area. So we were wanting to really look at the whole history of this field um, and how it had been used rather than just uh, the, the Neolithic finds which is why a lot of the test pits are concentrated on the edges um, of these terraces. Um, and this is what we found here is one of the test pits um, on the sort of upslope side of one of these terraces. And you can see very shallow. And then on the downslope side um, of one of the terraces, you've got very much thicker um, buildup of soil. Um, and here you can see this is really sort of mixed soil um, and this is clearly plough soil. And in fact, we could just about see um, two layers within this. So you've got a more recent plough soil and then possibly a very ancient uh, plough soil further down. And this is where um, most of our axe working debris was coming from. Um, flakes and rough outs were coming out of this mixed deposit. Um, so it does show that uh, a lot of the deposits in that area aren't undisturbed, they're all mixed into this plough soil um, over uh, uh, centuries uh, of ploughing. Um, including here, we've got uh, an example where you've got plough soil here, um, and this is the topsoil on the top, and the ploughing has sort of sorted some of the stone and it's moved downhill, so you've got a layer of stone in here, and in fact in there there is um, a, a rough out, um, as well as other um, axe flakes. So we can really see that some of this material is moving around um, quite a lot. Um, but some of it hasn't moved at all. Um, this is uh, a test pit that is very close to that deep one there, right on the edge um, of this uh, 
plowed terrace area. Um, but you can see there's hardly any plowing has happened uh, over this because you've got this really dense collection of stone in this test pit. Um, and you can see, just looking at this, some of these really sharp edged stones, you've got flakes and rip outs and things just on the surface here. Um, and this is one of perhaps one of our more important discoveries um, in this area, um, because this turned into a, a whole, the whole depth of this test pit was these very densely packed stones um, with axe debris all the way through. And this was dug uh, by our experienced volunteer, Jeff Marples, who um, did it very carefully digging um, in spits. And each level he recorded uh, where the flakes um, and other work stone was coming from, various different spits all the way down. And um, so we could see how these were spread out. And you can see this stone going all the way through. In fact, he didn't quite manage to get right down to the bottom to the uh, natural subsoil in this. Um, so this is uh, an area where it hasn't been disturbed and we've got layers of axe working all the way through here. Um, so actually this is a really important find. And in fact, you couldn't see any trace of this in the ground surface. Um, so we're really not sure what this feature is, whether this is um, a, a bit of the natural scree that's come much further than the rest of the screes, or perhaps more likely, it's actually a dump of sto stone and axe working debris that's been deliberately dumped here, forming a kind of, of cairn, and has built up um, over many phases of axe working. Um, so this is definitely something to investigate more um, in future and see what this is. This is our, our best bet for real in situ and um, undisturbed axe working. And this is the kind of thing that we were finding. Um, these are it's a whole variety of flakes. And um, here you've got um, the inside of the flake and, and the top of the flake, each one sort of compared. Um, and here you've got a lot of small flakes. And um, so this is sort of the outside of the flake and this is the inside. And again, with these big flakes, there's one side and, and here's the outside. These big flakes, so this, well, this series of flakes show how um, the stone was turned into axes. So um, the Neolithic people would have found a suitable piece of scree. And on these big flakes, you can see these are just the first attempts to remove odd lumps on the outside of the scree. So this is basically um, the outside of the natural scree and the flake has been struck off. So here's the inside of it where it's been struck off from the block. Uh, so this is very roughly shaping um, the scree lump. And then you take off the sort of medium sized flakes um, to shape it more precisely. And these you can sort of see how sharp edged they are. And actually they've got this sort of very flat top, which we call a striking platform, which would be sort of prepared so that uh, the people could actually strike this off in a very sort of precise way. And these are all sort of features you can look for to identify these as being actual um, flakes rather than just any other stone. And then these much smaller flakes doing very much finer work and including some very tiny flakes for really sort of shaping um, the stone to a, a precise shape they want for making the axe heads. Um, and we also found various rough outs. Um, so this is where they're, they're getting towards um, a, a decent um, axe shape. Um, so you get shapes like these being formed. Quite a lot of these rough outs break um, as they're being made. You can see here ones um, that have broken across, uh, so they've been thrown away. Um, and others clearly just weren't going to work properly, um, so they've been discarded quite quickly. Um, and this is actually the most interesting uh, rough out. So again, this is sort of the bottom side of it, and this is sort of almost triangular in cross section. This is the top of it. Um, and this is quite interesting because they were obviously going for a different shape with this. They're not aiming for a shape that you'd use for an axe head. This is almost parallel sided. Um, and I think this was discarded because it's got this funny lump on here, which they were never quite going to get rid of wasn't quite going to go into the shape they wanted. But it looks like they were aiming for more like a chisel um, rather than an axe. Um, and in fact, work that George Smith did at Up and Wine Plan Violet found um, a much more um, finished rough out, with exactly this kind of thing, sort of parallel sided, narrow, 
chisel shape. Um, and I do wonder if these were particular kinds of tools that were made, being made um, from this area, perhaps particularly from the, the stone um, from Dinas. Um, so here we have um, our field uh, and we've got, we actually got um, axe debris from all these test pits all the way across the field, not just the ones closest to the sprees, that axe working was going on all the way across here. Um, and it's, it's interesting to, to wonder how far this goes. We, we were aiming to try and get the limits of the axe working. And actually, we failed to do that because it went much further um, than we expected. Um, and actually, back in um, 2018, um, the water pipe, the mains water pipe in this area burst, uh, and Welsh Water had to replace um, that water pipe. Um, and there was an archaeological watching brief on that. And these uh, red triangles here are finds of axe working flakes running all the way across this area. So down just below where we've been looking and right the way across um, to the edge uh, of, of the river gorge here. Um, so that's shown that um, this axe working could go an awful lot further. Um, and I do think it would be good to do some test pitting um, in this field and see if we can get um, more down there. I would like to go further this way, uh, but especially this field and the ones below um, are some of Gareth's best silage fields. So he's not that keen for us digging holes in those. Um, so that's the sort of test pitting, which was the sort of almost prospecting to see where we could find um, axe working evidence. Um, but in the screes up here, um, because I'd looked at these before um, with David Jones, we knew that all the way through here, you can find lots of axe working evidence. Um, but the question is, how well preserved is that? Do we have different layers within the screes preserved, or is this all mixed up um, and actually of, of little value archaeologically. Um, so we wanted to have a look within these areas where we knew axe working was going on and see how well preserved the archaeological deposits were. Um, now I, I did quite a detailed survey over this area um, in 2018 and this is sort of the southern air, end of the area that I surveyed. And in this area you've got these sort of terraces running across um, some of which may well be to do with um, erosion of the sprees caused by erosion. Some of them have definitely been built up by people, um, but we're not quite sure what the significance um, of these are. Um, and in this area, you have quite a lot of bracken growth. Um, and that means that uh, in winter, when the bracken dies back, you can actually see what's on the surface of the soil, whereas the areas where there's grass, um, you can't see uh, any finds there, whereas under the bracken, you can actually see dotted all the way across here, you can see these little red spots. These are all flakes um, and work pieces. So we knew that there's lots of work pieces um, over this area. If you look in the open and um, unvegetated spree, uh, because it's open and loose, all the small finds have worked their way down through that. So it's quite hard to find um, any sort of in situ napping debris within that. Whereas areas where um, the spree is consolidated quite quickly um, after the working took place and soil is built up over it, we've got a good chance of actually finding these preserved deposits. So that's why we put in a little evaluation trench here right across this area. So this is a little trench measuring um, four metres by two metres. Um, and here's a very nice Jones drone shot by John Roberts and um, showing us digging this trench, which that shows where it's it's close to these open screes here. But here you've got screes with soil um, well sort of between the stones. And um, so it's less likely to move and, and lose these small um, uh, flakes. And you can see here, um, we've cleared away the bracken um, to get down uh, to this area. Um, we actually had quite good weather for most of the time, um, but this is sort of the, the, the last day on this trench trying to clean up um, quickly uh, and it's rather misty weather. Um, but this actually sort of shows we're actually on really quite a steep slope here 
and you can just about see this sort of terracing um, within the slope. And this is uh, what it looked like when the bracken was removed, and that this is basically just the surface of, of the soil. And already you can see a lot of these stones here um, have been, they're really angular, they have plates taken off them and have been napped. Um, and you can actually see um, even smaller plates on that surface. Uh, and one of my problems when, when we sort of had volunteers first come over to, to work on this trench was they, they kept saying, oh, Jane, look at this, look at this. And they, they sort of walk over in these areas picking up stuff because this whole scree slope is covered uh, with worked pieces. And I have to say, no, we're just recording what's in the trench because otherwise we will never finish. And um, so we took off this sort of really sort of thin topsoil here, which is mainly just rotted bracken. Um, and exposed uh, the stone below that, uh, which is a mixture of scree and again lots of worked pieces. Um, and here you can actually see the location of the trench uh, just above uh, the wall here. And this is the field um, where we did the test pitting in. So not too far from where we were working uh, with the test pitting. Um, and then we have an, um, recorded and uh, picked up all the finds within this top layer. Uh, we did another split down um, and took more soil off and so now we're working further into uh, this deposit um, again with loads and loads of flakes um, and work stone. And the question is how do you record this? Um, you could very carefully uh, do scaled plans of this um, but it's actually much quicker to use modern technology um, and uh, this is what we call photogrammetry I took lots of uh, different photographs um, of the trench uh, at each level. And you can see these targets here. These were uh, surveyed in very precisely with our GPS equipment. And then we use uh, a computer program to combine these photographs together. And it actually produces a 3D model. But from that, you can take an absolute completely vertical view uh, and you produce this image known as an ortho mosaic. Um, and from that, um, I actually traced over it and uh, onto drawing film that we could take out in the field. Um, and then you could uh, mark on different uh, stones and you could show which were flakes um, and you could label on which we were actually lifting and number the stones on the plan. This is the next level down. And this is uh, the plan that we produced from that. So that's the first level. And that's the next level down. You can see how many flakes there are. All these uh, red uh, marks here are um, flakes that we collected. The green stones are bigger stones uh, that have been roughly flaked. Um, but really, I didn't want to carry all those off the hill. Um, so um, we recorded those on site. Um, when I say we, again, I mean the volunteers. Um, and so they uh, measured and weighed these um, and photographed them so that we got um, a record uh, of what these were like um, and then uh, we discarded those in a heap um, so but at least we know what kind of material was coming out in these sort of rougher pieces. Um, and this is that uh, plan of the first layer and um, because this is actually sort of perhaps um, there's more sort of patterning in the uh, stones that we found. You can see up here, um, there's lots and lots of flakes all together in one area. And this to me looks like possibly a, a napping floor. And maybe somebody actually even sat quite close by um, doing quite fine work um, making a rough out and scattering uh, flakes about them. Um, we've got tons and tons of material from this trench and from the test pits as well. Um, but this all needs looking at in detail um, and measuring and possibly even we'll try and from this area um, put together um, join together some of these flakes, which we call refitting. And you can actually see um, which flakes came off a single object as it was worked down. Um, so we can actually perhaps prove that this was a napping floor and actually this might be from a single napping episode. Further down towards the bottom of the trench, there are some really big flakes. Um, and this almost looks like that this area, uh, there were different things going on. And this is where 
um, scree blocks were first being sort of opened up um, and just the very initial shaping being done. And perhaps uh, then they're taken off elsewhere and um, to be finished off. So it already looks as if you've got different things going on um, in different parts of the trench. Right, so um, we've done quite a lot of work um, it's still in, in these sort of just these two areas. So up here, we've probably got a, a settlement site um, up in the quite um, uh, higher areas up in the uplands. Um, and we've sort of seen how extensive um, the axe working is down near the actual sort of sources. Um, but looking at the red dots again, you can see these scattered all the way around um, different parts of the landscape. Uh, and so there's plenty to look at to see what does this mean? How have these uh, flakes of roof, roof rats got to these different parts of the landscape? There's certainly Garrick Bower here um, where we know there's working here. And I think um, it, it's, we need to start looking at these other different areas um, and seeing what's going on. Um, as I was saying, there's lots of other things going on in this landscape as well, some of which may also be Neolithic in date. Um, there are some axe hammers that have been found from this area. Um, certainly there was a very nice um, uh, stone battle axe found for, up in the quarries, um, which is probably very late uh, Neolithic and um, early Bronze Age. Um, but these simple sort of stone axe hammers um, might well be um, Neolithic in date. Um, so it's how do these relate um, to the, the axes produced here? They're certainly not made from the same stone. Over the other side of the valley, um, there's an arrow stone, which is a, a, a boulder with um, grooves worn in it. Um, people often think these are for sharpening arrows, but I'm not quite sure how that works. Um, the date of those is very uncertain. They, they may or may not be prehistoric, but a little bit further up, there's a big boulder um, with little round cut marks uh, marked in it. And it's very likely that that is Neolithic in date. Um, that's there on the edge of Garrick Barrow where you've got axe working and just right across from Binyas. Um, so it's interesting to speculate what significance that has um, for this area. But also some of the, the later um, sites could be quite important. Just near where we've been uh, working, and there's quite a large Bronze Age barrow. This is a, a, a burial mound. And then further up uh, in, in the hills, there's another barrow up here. Uh, barrows quite often seem to be um, located along routeways. And in fact, if you sort of head over in that direction, um, you get to uh, the Menaherion, um, the Druid Circle, um, which is a, a stone circle of Bronze Age date, which also seems to be on um, a routeway. And this may all be part of the same Bronze Age route um, across the hills. And if this was used in uh, the Bronze Age, perhaps this was the main way uh, up onto the uplands in the Neolithic as well. Um, and certainly you could start here and you're not far um, from this possible settlement site here. Um, certainly our work um, at uh, Nysabrin suggests that people were living up in the uplands, um, which as I say, you know, this wasn't such a, a desolate um, open landscape uh, as it is now. So that's, that's not so uh, improbable. Um, and actually also looking at some other sites, you see what these burnt mounds um, up in this, uh, this area. These are sites um, that were probably used for cooking, um, if not other things. Um, you find them in wet areas, but I don't think they're very far from settlement. Um, and probably most of these are Bronze Age in date, um, but burnt mounds actually started being used uh, in the Neolithic period. So it's not impossible that some of these were in use while uh, axes were still being produced in this area. But these are suggesting that certainly in the Bronze Age, people were living up here. Um, and, and if they were living there in the Bronze Age, um, they could certainly have been living up in these higher levels, um, at least in summer anyway, um, in the Neolithic. So instead of just little sites, we have um, this whole landscape that we've got uh, dry fluid here. Um, we've got the, the end of Penrama Mountain, uh, Dinas and Garigbar, where you've got these sources 
um, where we know axes were being made, but you've got evidence of axe working over a much wider um, area here, uh, especially around the area uh, of wine clan buyer. Um, and this is something that um, I'd, I'd love to investigate more in future. Um, especially there's, there's a particular sort of little hollow um, up here that looks very inviting. And, and I'm sure that um, we could find much more um, about this, this idea of the people living up here um, in the Neolithic. Um, and to actually show people um, much more about this wider landscape, um, myself and uh, John Roberts led two archaeology walks uh, across here, um, looking at um, the work we did around Dinas and walking across to um, Gryglewid. And in fact, here we're up on the top of Gryglewid, looking at uh, one of the areas of quarrying there. Um, and hopefully we can um, uh, actually do some, some more of these in future. So there's an awful lot more to do here. Um, we're really only just starting um, investigating this, um, but uh, we've got more work um, coming up um, this year, um, and, and hopefully we might even get um, uh, an, another field work year in. So um, this has really been um, partnership working. So here, th thanks to all the, the organisations that, that have been involved in this. Um, and th thanks also to uh, Gareth Wynne Jones uh, at Tinnacleed and Farm who allowed us to um, dig holes uh, in our field. But um, particular thanks um, to, to all our many, many volunteers that have been involved in this. Um, and there'll certainly be an opportunity for much more um, uh, volunteer involvement and work on this um, in the fairly near future. So thank you very much. <laughs>